Thanks for joining us for part two. We've uh, upgraded our memory setup for our ever-growing video on our <laughs> sort of our top ten uh, far reenactorisms. Yep. Uh, so I left off at my number five. So we're on the skipper's number six. So number six. This is this actually might be my biggest like thing that makes me booty tickled or <laughs> butt hurt or frustrated or <laughs> rant. And it's probably the biggest complaint among all reenactors, except for those who do it. And that's ethnic uniforms. Or oh. ethnic pieces of gear. So that's your kilts, your Glengarry's, your Balmoral bonnets. Um, no kilts, please. Your, uh... It's mostly the Confederates I see that do this. Wearing coonskin caps, animal furs... <sighs> Just the wackiest. The just, barrel wraps. The barrel wraps and the wrist cappers. Those things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they make me want to punch puppies. Yeah, you shouldn't be getting Civil War equipment at, like, Cabela's. You know? Yeah, no. Um, yes, there were units who wore kilts for parade. Yeah. And those were the 79th New York Islanders. They wore kilts for parade, and they had... Uh, Tartan trousers called shrews. They only wore them very early in the war. They weren't worn that often. And yes, I get it. You're proud of your Scottish heritage or your Irish heritage. Really? Yeah. Same here. You know, I'm very much a, an American mutt, but a lot of my heritage is Scotch, Irish, and English. But I'm not going to be out there, you know, with a basket hilt sword, wearing my kilt, you know, going, bra more. Yeah, <laughs> going brave hard with my face painted blue, screaming freedom. You know. <laughs> Stuff like that. It they weren't worn. There's no documentation of it except for those very select few units and the very select few times. And it's probably consistently the fastest way to end up on Happy Friends of Civil War Farm. And the fastest way to make me want to throat punch you. I'm gonna say it. It's just one of those things where I see it and I just feel parts of my body just start catching on fire and it's just like if i could light you on fire with my stare i would do it yeah if, if you if, if wearing I mean, we're just choosing a kilt because it's it's common in the hobby it more is. than some of the other sort of uh, impressions and don't go me get me wrong kilts are sexy they're uh, awesome but especially if you wear them traditionally if if you, all that. If, <laughs> if, you, if you have to wear a kilt English military might be the way for you to go. Yes. Because they wore those in combat. Cameron Highlanders. Many years. Black Watch. Uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, an American Civil War thing. It is not. It uh, really unless your impression is like a parade in New York in 1861. And if, if you're like, that, in downtown New York. I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Please let me see that. That is... Kilts are awesome. I love... It's the Scottish heritage of me. I love kilts, but... When I see him at events, I just <laughs> I die, I die a little on the inside, and that goes with bagpipes. <laughs> I swear, there's a piper at least once at every event. I mean, granted, we do have not the, as much anymore. Yeah, it it is starting to die off, probably because they've been ridiculed so much. Yeah, I love bagpipes, and you know the 79th that's here in Washington. They are an amazing unit. They take it seriously. They wear the trues at certain events, mostly early war. And they do have actual bagpipers that play in their unit after hours. In fact, they've gone to world competitions and have won, like, second and first place. They beat the Scots, who, you know, created it at their own game. But it's just one of those things where it drives me nuts to see, especially at events, because... It just wasn't done. It's the time and place and documentation. Yeah. So, if... if I mean, if sort of sort of showing your, your cultural heritage is important, documentation. Yeah. Put it to a time and a place, and if it's not the entire war, you, that means you only kind of get to wear it once. Yeah. It might just be event specific. It might yeah. be uh, battle specific. Um, but you know, unless you have written proof of that happening, try to blend in a little bit more. Yeah, and that really goes with the whole wearing of. Dead animal skins. I don't know where that came from. And this is only a Confederate thing I've noticed. And it's not really here in Washington all that much. I mean, there was uh, the former colonel of our Confederate battalion who unfortunately did pass away two years ago. But he always wore a skunk cap. 
That was a real one. That was I mean, yeah, it was a that. real skunk. Yeah, that yeah. was cool. Yeah, that but, wasn't like the kid Sutler hat. Yeah, yeah, and you know, yes, the Confederate uh, logistics, you know, they were poor. You know, they were wearing jean wool, which was a considered a low grade material of the time but they did not wear you know fox hats they didn't wear coonskin caps yeah and that's one of the things too like i mean confederates are so important to this hobby in american history and the story needs to be told and shared but i kind of feel bad for the confederates when i when i see that and i see that get being allowed yeah because confederates were professional soldiers they were like they were amazing they they consistently hammered the federal army in the early stages of the war, and yet you see so many reenactors portraying them as, like, bumpkins and Cletus the slack-jawed yokel. Yeah, and, you know, it, in a way it really is slapping the original Confederate soldiers in the face. And, you know, a lot of our family heritage, I mean, I had family members that fought for the Confederacy, and when I see that, it's just, why are you trashing what I had family members fight, possibly die, and suffer for? You know, it's just... Yeah, and that's that's probably the most powerful point about reenacting. Is like it's one thing to get your uniform right and kind of having the pride of good research, but you're portraying actual people. Yeah. Um, actual units and actual experiences, and so there's a certain level where it's like sometimes every historian kind of has to uh, sort of make some reasonable historically centered guesses. Yeah. When there's data currently missing. But just to be creative because you think it'd be fun or cute or cool, yeah, um, that could go really bad really quick. Yeah, and those who wear kind of like the skins and all that, they're made fun of by everyone. <laughs> like they are the Farb's Farb, <laughs> and they'll end up on Happy Friends too. Yeah, and yeah. then that goes into probably the one that you make like kind of poke fun at, but also share my same sentiments with. Is the the leather wrist cappers or the stock cappers, and the leather uh, barrel band, uh, barrel shrouds, barrel covers, barrel condoms, whatever you want to call them? <laughs> yeah. They did not exist. They were not a thing. Keep that to your biker club. You know that's when I see that I think like you know when did you know Sans uh, Sans Sons of Anarchy show up? <laughs> it just didn't exist. Yeah, and if you are insistent, if you are one of these offenders with, like, you know, the cappers and stuff like that, okay, you have a photo? We'd love to see it. Yeah, if, um, you, if you have the original documentation of those existing... If you got a wet plate, put it on our Facebook Please provide page. it. I, then, <laughs> then I would ease up on it. We will dump cap. Yeah, I, I will <laughs> gladly ease up on that and admit, yes, those did exist. You know, it's one of those things where we're not too proud to be like oh well okay i guess it did no like we'd be like okay good job for doing the research on it you know but it's one of those things where it's the leopard skin trousers <laughs> you know there's only one guy who had it doesn't mean everyone gets to do it yeah it's just one of those things but that's my number six that's a good one my number six uh is actually uh i'd be surprised if he has it on his is directing columns with swords that actually isn't on my <laughs> I think it, it should have been probably under my improper commands, but... It's, it's when, like, the officers, uh, apparently, soldiers don't know how to follow the unit in front of them, uh, or hear by commands. Left, by right. Yeah, you get, you get this. It's not like, you know, of, you know, instructional use or ceremonial use. It's or like, like when you're you... leading a charge and, you know, you're trying to... It, it's the Civil War turn signal. Yeah, uh, is what it is for a column, and that that's not a thing. Sorry, it's yeah. not in a manual. Yeah, you you're following the person in front of you. You know, you don't need the the officer to show you which way. So if you're an officer who does that, stop, please. I will admit, I did do that when I was a first sergeant, and I had an NCO sword. I we were all young and didn't know better. I did at some that, point. and then I learned that it wasn't to do, and that sword just stuck by my side or in the scabbard or. On the ground for order arms. And not everything you see in a movie is actually historically accurate. Gettysburg was the Spoiler. biggest culprit of that. That happened a lot in Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah, it was only in Gettysburg <laughs> that I've seen that. So that 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 is a reenactorism. So that is something that is unique to this hobby and not during the Civil War. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other one, uh, my number seven. Seven. Seven was. Confederates were a rabble, which goes into your, you know, they yeah. were professional soldiers. You know, they weren't these 
you know, just thrown together... Goobers. Yeah, they they weren't. They were drilled just like the Union Army. In fact, at times they actually surpassed the Union Army with what they were able to do with their drill. They weren't... I mean, early in the war... They had yes, the best officer corps to start out with. They really did. You know, they weren't this thrown together rabble. You know, yes, early in the war, both armies were because they were mostly militia, but they were drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and, drilled and then drilled some more. And, you know, they just weren't this hodgepodge of, you know, okay, this company knows how to march, this one can barely tie their shoes, and these guys are... What was that, black out their teeth? Yeah. It's just, you know, one of those things where it's just... You can't keep up with Stonewall on all those long marches, his foot cavalry, if you're if you're a bumpkin. Yeah. Like, you, you were a serious soldier, high level of esprit de corps, high level of training, serious veteran soldiers who took their job and their message seriously. Yeah. So, you know, just because I reenact Union does not mean I won't go to bat for the Confederates, because, as I've said in this video already, I've had family members that fought for the Confederacy. So it's... When I hear that, it's just like, don't... Don't stop on my family, please. Well, it, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, at least out here, you see a lot of the sort of liberties taken with Confederates. But I would say consistently, like, I would probably say there are more hardcore Reb units. Yeah. Like, oh, like, intensely hardcore um, than there are federal units. Yeah. I mean, these people just do it right. They dedicate their lives to historical accuracy and not just kind of making a, a goofy gimmick yeah. out of it. Yeah. That's a good one. Yes, yeah, so what's your number seven? Uh, oh, gosh, these are really, like, NCO... The, focused. Uh, well, overly obnoxious officers and NCOs. Um, the ones that, like, during, like, assembly, you know, to the colors, they're all like, blah, 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 you know, you know, foot on the line, and, uh, you know, what's up with your blah, 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 or, I said turn here, you know, calm left, blah, and it's like, uh, I'm, as, as an NCO, um, I don't know what they're trying to do, and there are a few officers who do it too, they're just like, I said blah, <laughs> um, and... That is terrible. I think they feel like they're trying to have like this martial, like hardcore, like serious disciplinarian. But when in fact they've seen glory in Sergeant Major Mulcahy <laughs> so many times. Yeah, but Mulcahy was training new soldiers. Yeah, like this is like like sixty two right now in our in our organization. Yeah, if you have to yell and treat your soldiers that way, you are terrible at your job. Um, like if you are well drilled, well practiced. You should, well, one, as a leader, you should never reprimand one, let alone your company in front of itself. That's bad leadership. Yes. Um, Do but, it in private. Yeah, if you're having to yell and bark and belittle your soldiers as part of some sort of impression, it didn't happen. It wasn't a thing. I'm sure at some point someone kind of lost their mind. There's lots of horror stories of bad officers, but yeah. that was because it was, you know, maybe a political appointment or whatever. Yeah, uh, man. <laughs> but yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing that in a hobby. Um, it's one thing if you're doing drill and you're trying to hammer home the point, but an NCO, an officer, well, particularly an NCO, is to educate the soldier. And if they are not performing their job, you failed your job. So when you yell at your company or your platoon, you are making yourself look like the idiot. Yeah, and that's that's the military perspective. It's a bad impression. Treat your soldiers with respect. Yeah. Be hard on your privates in private, and then your men. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, number seven. No, this is number eight. No, oh, number eight now. Number eight is items not used for that unit. So you'll see, <laughs> like, uh, Army of the Potomac Gators, the White Gators, on certain units that never wore them. Have you, locks, just because it's hot out. Yeah, you know, things that weren't used i mean i've seen guys wearing the sharpshooter leggings that are confederates and union it's just like they actually didn't wear those exact ones um i've seen guys wear uh the zoophezes when they're <laughs> just a standard blue unit um yeah it's just it's weird to see how people think things are okay and it's just it's the lack of the leadership saying, trying to nip it in the bud. Like, oh, Stop well, it. okay, you spent the money on that. Well, I guess we'll let you wear it. It's like, That's cute. It's like, please don't. Because it's not only making the unit look bad, but also you as you know a commander or an NCO look bad. And it's just one of those things that really needs to not happen. 
Yeah, going to a sutler isn't a blank, blank slate. You're not. It's not a costume shop. Just because oh, they have it doesn't mean it's right. That's cool. Oh man, this really goes with this, man. I, I, I look really awesome. It's like no, you, you look like a fool. Yeah. Um, there are examples of having mixed gear that are super hardcore. Yes. Um, Confederates often had lots of federal gear. Yep. Um, because we taught in you know, knapsacks right, and hide a man. You know, you get canteens. Because uh, normally we were better supplied, and if we lost supplies. The Union Army could get resupplied a lot yeah. easier than the South. Yeah, so the Confederacy was a lot more battlefield pickup. So, like, when you see, you know, a Union soldier carrying around, you know, a Confederate piece of kids. Probably, uh, probably not. You know, uh, yeah, and, and, and if it is, that'd be, like, specific. I mean, that would be, like, a fresh yeah. battlefield. Unless or they like, took a depot. Yeah, and it again, it comes... I think all mine really come down to... <laughs> Documentation. <laughs> Documentation. There's a theme here. Like, if, if it's there, cool. If you can supply it, I will gladly accept that and not give you a hard time and be like, you know, awesome job for going that extra step and really digging deep. Mm-hmm. I, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Again. <laughs> Word. So. Uh, my number eight, uh, this one is for uh, Corporal Hardway and Private Turnin. Uh, women soldiers who don't try hard enough on their impression for male soldiers. Thank you for taking my um, <laughs> There, I mean, it's it's pretty bad. Um, it, a lot of people in the hobby are, uh, there are quite a few people who really frown on women portraying the uh, soldier role. There were women in disguise. It's well documented. Company D actually knew of one uh, in the in a neighboring company at one point. Uh, so it, it happened. But uh, the women in it some, oftentimes got away with it. Uh, and so if you are, if you're a woman, you know, there are lots of units that will take you. Like if you're serious about the hobby, yeah. um, but get rid of the, the, the nail polish, the, the face piercings, the makeup, the long hair, do something with the long hair, the weird makeup, colors of hair. weird colors of hair. Um, y- your whole idea is to become a man. Yeah. And to, to blend it. And you know, a lot of that goes into uh binding too. Yeah. Especially with hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and there's great forums out there for women reenactors, um, and you know, how to bind properly. Yeah, because uh, it, it's kinda hard to explain, you know, like this giant festering chest wound that would otherwise fill the top of a sack coat while yeah. you're on a march. Like you would be in a hospital if you're that wounded yeah to be that bloated up there yeah and there are some women who I mean, crush it there was one when i first started reenacting almost 10 years ago i did not know she was a woman i mean guys would drop trowel right in front of her and you know spring a leak right there you know on the halt of a march and she would just they wouldn't even know and then you know and she never spoke that was the thing too because she had a very feminine voice and then one day she started talking in line when a guy was you know, doing his business right next to her, and he's like, oh, God, and, you know, really embarrassed and all that, and, but she did it very, very well. I mean, the binding, the wearing, you know, the hat low, always kind of having her head down, yeah. you know, always kind of, always had hands in the pockets and, you know, kind of tucked under sleeves or across the arms, you know. There are those who can do it very well, and there's a vast majority who don't, because... They yeah. think it's acceptable. And... Yeah, I mean, long hair, ponytails. Uh, all, I mean, it's it's bad. And it makes a whole hobby. Again, for me, um, it, that's like wearing sunglasses. Yeah. Um, I mean, granted, if it's like your first one, you're trying, you're not going to be there right away. But uh, do your research. If you want to be a woman in the hobby, you're totally welcome. But uh, you're going to have, you should have the same high standards for blending your impression as anyone else. Yeah. So on to number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Uh, s- just <clears throat> really solid impressions ruined by small things. My busy- biggest example is seeing an officer with a really nice, you know, like Brian White, Brian White made uh, officer sack coat with really good trousers, awesome leathers, awesome cap, hiking boots, <laughs> or tennis shoes. And tennis shoes. The hiking boots, the combat boots, or the tennis shoes, the only place I will find that acceptable is the brand new recruit who is trying it out for that battle or that day. Or someone in a mainstream uniform. Because like if you're yeah. just like Pakistani outfit head to toe, I'm not I'm not gonna like have such a big deal about yeah, it's shoes. Hard. You know, it's like <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's when someone really goes that extra step, and I get it. Comfort for the feet is a really big thing. But if you're, have that option, if you're that already going to drop all that money on your uniform and your leather gear, Missouri Boot and Shoe. Custom. Custom made custom. to your feet. You have to measure your feet and they make it to that. And it's not that expensive for a pair of Brogans. Yeah, and one of my... One Relatively of, speaking. the Probably the most the biggest fraud that I'm guilty of is I put inserts in my Brogans. Yeah. Uh, for starters, I'm on, on my I'm on my feet all the time. If I don't see it, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, and, and no one ever sees it. I mean, you'd be a weirdo if you're like sniffing my shoes or digging around in my brogans. I yeah. mean, um, that's a little extreme. Yeah, and then, yeah. So if you have like special like foot issues, health issues with your feet, then you can have that modified to a historically accurate boot or shoe. Yeah, I mean, all you'd have to do is just have your insoles on your feet while you mm -hmm. measure it, and they'll make it to that. With, I mean, they'll be like, oh, you got some weird shaped feet, but you don't have to tell me you're getting insoles. But it's just one of those things that when I see it, it's more of a disappointment in that reenactor because it's like you went all out for everything you have with your uniform and your impression. But the one thing that, and yes, people do see it, the public see it. There's been times I've been laying dead on the field or even kind of the few battles that we've sat out and mingled among the public, like, Oh, look, they're wearing tennis shoes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know they wore combat, like rubber soles or like combat boots in the Civil War. Or you get the guy with like the uh, the tan uh, combat boots, the modern oh. military boots. And it's just... <laughs> no, or the zippers on the side. That's that's the funniest one that I've seen is the zippers. Yeah, I, and I, maybe, I'll, maybe you'll agree with me on this one. Um, if... Say you, you have a low budget or you, you can't contribute a ton of time to the hobby yeah. and you have a mainstream uniform, but it is all accurate. It may not be the highest quality, yeah. but you are accurate head to toe. You are going to stand out with your low dollar kit far more than someone with a thousand dollar kit and sunglasses or yeah. some other piece of a wristwatch. Yep. A modern yeah. wristwatch. Yeah. And I'm not just trying to hound on the shoes because that, you know, is... Probably the, you that's probably the most extreme, but yeah. that's the one I see that stands out to me the most. But yeah, the wristwatch, the modern glasses. Um, oh, God, there was one that I saw a year or two ago, and it drove me absolutely nuts, and I can't remember what it was. It was a double bag knapsack with the straps modified with backpack straps. Like normal, like, no. I'm going to college, Mom. Backpack straps. I get it. It's for comfort, but if the knapsack is bothering you with the straps that much, don't wear a knapsack. It's that simple, but I'm sorry. When I see shiny, you know, synthetic pads that are angled and all that, it's going to stand out to me, and I'm just... Uh, yeah, no. You're please. not helping anything, people. Yeah, you're not. You're not helping my blood pressure. And if you need that, you're probably wearing your double bag wrong anyway. Like, yeah, you can adjust that so it's halfway comfortable. They're comfy, actually. Believe it or not, if you know mm -hmm. how to do it right. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess my number nine is a short one. Uh, saluting wrong, not saluting. Yep. Um, just so you know, you don't do this. You do this. Don't oh. bear a claw. Yeah, no bear claw. Do this. Got to keep those fingers together. Um, and salute properly know when to do it know how to salute you know under arms or on guard know your ranks yeah uh you don't have to do it constantly so you know every time your captain comes out of his tent you know all, bah, bah. yeah <laughs> it's like dude i just saw it if you're in the same area you salute once you're done um and then oh the, the other big thing is the highest ranking person in a group salutes so if you if it's just me and like 12 privates only one person salutes the senior officer coming yeah. in camp. It's that simple. You don't all like... I mean, you'll stand and be in attention. Yeah. Uh, but only one person salutes. Pull them out. It's different for Navy, but you yeah. get the point. And the other part with that, too, is the proper greetings. You barely ever hear that. It's always, you know, you go by morning, afternoon, evening, and the rank. You know, if you don't know that rank of a first sergeant, it's, you know, good morning, first sergeant. If you know it, you know, good morning for Sergeant Kev. You know, I'm walking by and, you know, I'll see someone saluted and, you know, salute back. But, you know, you never hear like, oh, like, good afternoon, Captain Whitehall, or good afternoon, sir. You just salute and, okay. But if you're addressing an NCO 
or an officer, you always, you know, proper greeting of the day. Rank. The rank, if you know the last name, give it. If not, the rank suffices. You know, I'd rather have someone, you know, good afternoon, sir, than, oh, hey, yeah, uh, uh, captain. Because I will ignore you. <laughs> Until I hear the proper greeting, or if I see you doing the proper salute and greeting and all that, then, of course, then I will acknowledge you. Just because, you know, we're reenactors. We're trying to portray a military setting. You would be that's disciplined you would if you messed it up back yeah. then. I mean, it's that simple. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just my... <clears throat> Uh, expanding on for you. Um, where was my other one? I think we're on the last one. Yeah, we're, we're on 10. number 10. So number 10 for me... Honestly would have to be seeing people out of dress. So you'll see... I get it. It's hot. You know, and especially some events... I would completely understand, especially if it's like 110 degrees out... Yeah, honestly, you shouldn't be reenacting at that point because that's a health yeah. issue waiting to happen. But seeing people out of the company street, you know, going to Sutler Row or going to other camps in shirt sleeves. Yeah. Coat. Just one button. You know, if it's really hot, don't even button it. I would be completely lax on that. <clears throat> but no, uh, no cover. You know, braces down, barefoot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if you're in, in our unit, if you're leaving the camp, you are going to be in uniform. Yeah. Uh, the only time you can be naked is fatigue detail. Yep. And, and that's, even in period photos, that's, you'll, you'll see people even without a shirt on. Yeah. Which is like, oh, scandalous back yeah. then. But I mean, if you're digging, you know, earthworks and bomb proofs, you're going to be getting dirty. You want to be comfy. <laughs> yeah. You want to be cool and comfy as much as possible. And that really goes for, you know, especially when you're not in your camp and you're walking around, you're portraying a Civil War era... Gentlemen, you have women around. You don't want to be seen naked. And being it's in offensive. your shirt sleeves was offensive. If you have a vest on, that's one thing. But, you know, walking around with a long slit, you know, your civilian shirt and your braces on, technically naked. You know, coat. Yeah. It's not that hard. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's familiar with modern military, you'd be in the same amount of trouble for being out of uniform today as you would 150 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be a little less scandalous for women uh, today than it would be uh, in the, you know, Victorian America. But yeah. uh, still, keep that in mind, and having a martial appearance is what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, my number 10 is uh, kind of goes off what you were talking about. Um, this is something that's long bugged me. Uh, I granted, you know, good footwear costs a lot of money. Sometimes you have to save up for it. But there are pretty decent alternatives. So, like, if you have to wear modern footwear, there are some footwear that blend in pretty well. And there are some modern cuts of, like, business shoes that, yeah. I mean, can look just like Brogan's uh, from even five feet away. Like, you'll oh, yeah. a lot of people. Um, but the thing that drives me nuts are Vibram insoles. They're great work boots. I got some in my closet. They're they're great for walking around the mountains. But when you take a hit, there's a yellow tag that you can see from yep. 500 yards away, screaming, "Look at me, Ma! I'm a farb!" Uh, so that's terrible. Uh, the other thing, um, and I I think this is a lack of uh, educating on reenactors' part, is farb handkerchiefs. Yes. And see these modern ones, okay? No place in Civil War reenacting. Get rid of them. These don't belong. Burn them. Use them for fire starter, please. Yeah, you know, this This stays, you know, in your modern clothes. You know, they have lots of uses. There are sutlers out there that have many options of wonderful period correct design handkerchiefs. Yes. Um, and some are, you know, like 18 to $30 depending on the pattern. They, they also and size. And Some size. are huge. You can almost use them as a dog tent half. <laughs> um, yeah, and then all of those patterns come with documentation, so that's even cooler. Yeah. So I'm I, one of the you. You know, if I'd have belonged to someone in your specific unit, portray that person even if you can. Yeah, and um, and so maybe I don't have that money. I'm a new reenactor. I'm a young reenactor. Of uh, Private Severson just totally crushed it. He got a piece of cotton broadcloth. And he dyed it at home with yeah. like blueberries or raspberries or something. Something like that. So yeah. he used his own natural dyes and a piece of cloth so he can keep cool. And it was just broadcloth. So yeah. cost him zero dollars. And he had creativity points for using natural period correct dyes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I mean, you don't have to be fancy or expensive to have the knee, the usage of a handkerchief uh, during the Civil War. And I've seen all sorts of colors. When I was in that state south of us, uh, it starts with an O, but I won't say the name. Uh, I swear I oh, saw huh? at least one person with uh, an orange, uh, a safety orange modern handkerchief wrapped around their neck in battle. It was... It was it was sad, and I my I, I felt bad for the, the 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 kid who was doing it, you know, mid late teens. Uh, I I felt angry at the first sergeant for allowing that sort of crap to happen in the unit. It's like, dude, it's one thing you're letting this person embarrass themselves. Yeah, and like that, our job is to catch that. You know, you want to look good, have fun, be respected. You catch the small things. Yeah, and really, I think that's what all of our kind of farbisms come down to is a lot of the leadership it's comes down a lot on the leadership allowing you know standards to slide uh things to get lax and you know so we're not trying to make anyone feel bad this is just kind of the small things that drive us nuts and things we've learned from experience because we used to do those things so it's not like we're trying to make people feel bad it's just you know look up you know look up the regulations look up you know, the history of a unit, the research, stuff like that, so. Yeah, and if and if you don't know, if you're not certain, ask someone. There are lots of forums out there. You could ask us. If we don't know the answer, we'll send you to someone or a resource that you can check yourself. Period manuals and period photographs have tons of information available to you. There, There's not, there's unless you're highly specialized, you're in one very narrow field, all your generic Civil War reenacting questions can be easily found if you find the right people to ask. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Because there's an expert in everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, thanks so much for watching this long sort of chat about uh, farbisms and reenactorisms. Uh, please let us know some of the ones that drive you insane. Uh, or maybe share something that you used to do when you didn't know better. Uh, thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing. And we'll see you next time.